in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. We appreciate your presence here in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you and you that's listening out in the radio listening audience. We most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you in song as well as a help from the Word of God. You in the radio listen audience, if you'll call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour. I believe we can be a blessing to them. We appreciate that very much. If you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. It's page 352 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. While you're turning there, I want to say if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to the station where you're now listening, speaking to you out in the radio listen audience, of course, you can get our broadcast at 12 o'clock noon. That's WNGC 95.5 on the FM dial, the big giant station here in Athens. You can get our daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon Monday through Saturday. I hope you'll tune in. Now we do record all Sunday morning programs. This morning singing in the message will be on cassette tape 197. Cassette tape 197. I'm going to speak on the man that was left in the field to die. When his master found out he was sick, he had no more need for him. I'm going to speak about that today. Now you can write in and get some of our cassette tape. And we'd be glad to send for you for $3 each. I'll send you a list of our cassette tape. We have 196 listed here. I'll be glad to send you a list of these tape at your request. Then you can select the ones you want. And then we'd like to send you a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. We're planning our tour for March the 10th. Leaving on March the 10th, we had a 10-day tour. We've been to the Holy Land some 12 times. We're looking forward to this next trip. We're going to Israel. Of course, in Israel, we'll be visiting the Garden Tomb, Mount Calvary, the Upper Room, David's Tomb. We'll be riding on a boat over the Sea of Galilee. We'll be going to Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in Israel. We'll be going to the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, of course. After we leave Israel, we're going to Rome. We'll visit the prison where Paul spent his last days, probably the catacombs, the Sistine Chapel, and many other places in Rome that I'm sure you'd be interested in as a Christian. So if you'd like to go with us or like to send your pastor and his wife or know of a friend that might be interested, just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me the brochure on the proposed Holy Land tour. We'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. We'd like for you to pray for us and stand by this whole mission work. Man called me from the hospital today, said, Preacher, please pray for me. Pray for my family. They're depressed and we listen to your radio program. It's such a blessing. We're always glad to be a blessing through the radio ministry. We work us together in getting out the gospel. I thank God for those that God has spoken to and raised up to help us stay on the air. We're now in our 38th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. The Bible says in the last days there'd be wars and rumors of wars. We know that's true now. He also said there'd be earthquakes in diverse places. You've been hearing all the news, see it on your TV screens, what happened down in um, America, I mean, uh, Mexico, and the many hundreds that are killed down there. We need to be concerned about this, of course. This morning news, 8 o'clock on WNGC, the, the news lady said the Pope said he was praying for the dead. Well, while the dead's praying for the dead, you that are alive and know God ought to pray for those that are alive. They're the ones to pray for. Let the spirits of the dead pray for the physically dead all they want to. But you that are alive, spirits, you pray for those that are alive. They're the ones that need our prayers. Wasting your time and your effort. And it's even stupid to pray for the dead, if you know what I think about it. And they're already gone. You're going to pray for people, you need to pray for them while they're alive. Amen. All right, let's remember these people down there in prayer that God will help them. And they're dominated by a religion that knows nothing about salvation. That's pathetic. Very few of them know anything about God, and yet they're dominated by a religion that you cannot be saved by their doctrine. It's pitiful. 
And we need to be concerned about this. I hope you're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And reading the paper the other day where deer seasons open up. People go out deer hunting with bow and arrows and then with rifles. Reminded me of the man that said his wife wanted to go deer hunt. She had never gone and she wanted to go and so he consented to let her go. They went in and he put her up on the stand and he went on a short way away to get on his stand. He wasn't on his stand very long. He heard her rifle go off. So he ran up to help her out and when he arrived on the scene, she was down on the ground and there stood a man. They were arguing. She said, it's mine. He said, no, it's mine. And she said, no, it's mine. He said, no, it's mine. And she pulled a rifle up, aimed between his eyes, said, it's mine. He said, all right, lady, just give me time to take off the bridle and the saddle. You can have it. And so whatever you go deer hunting, you need to know what to shoot at. And when a preacher is preaching the gospel, he needs to aim in the right direction. Know what he's shooting at. Amen. All right. Thank you for the amen. If I had two, I'd have felt better. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, we find a story here how that uh, David had joined up with the Philistines temporarily because Saul was after his hide. And while he was out uh, away from Ziklag, Ziklag was a place where he left his wife and his children. And the wives and children of uh, many of his men, some 600 men that were with him. And while he was away, then the Amalekites came in and there they burned up the city. And they took David's wives captive and as well as the wives and children of his soldiers. And they took off all the spoils, everything they could get worth anything. And they took him away while David and his men were gone. And when David came back and he and his men saw that Ziklag had been burned and their wives and children missing and all their goods missing, then of course they began to weep and many of them, their strength went from them. They sobbed because the loss of their family. And David said, we need to set out and see if we can't locate the people that did this and maybe we can recover our families and our goods. And so David and his 600 men took off to see if they couldn't find the people from uh, the uh, Amalekites that had gone in and burned Ziklag. Now with that in mind, they're taken off after these him drank water. And they gave him a piece of the cake of figs and two trusses of raisins. And when it eaten, his spirit came again unto him he had eaten no bread, nor drank any water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? At which art thou? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to the Amalekites. And my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. And we made an invasion upon the south of the Kethrites, and upon the coast which belonged to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canest thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me, nor deliver me in the hands of my master. I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines, now the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. There escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode up on camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing like unto them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Now that's as far as I'm reading. And if you notice here, they found a man that had fallen sick in the field. And because he had taken ill, his master that had used him for a period of time just left him to die. I want us to see a plan of God's redemption and salvation that can be applied to sinners taken from this narrative. And I hope that God will speak to our hearts there are several things I want to point out and follow me closely, please. 
Number one, now we're talking about the man that found in the field. Number one, notice his citizenship. The Bible says in verse 11, they found an Egyptian in the field. Now Egypt here is a type of the world, of course. And they found this Egyptian, a man from Egypt, a type of the world. He's a type of all lost sinners in the world. And he's found in the field. Jesus said in John chapter 4, Look on the fields for the white down the harvest, and the labors are few. Now this man is a type of every sinner that's out in the field, away from God, out in the world, away from God. If you're unsaved today, you like this poor Egyptian. You're out there in a field, starving spiritually, away from God, and you need to be quickened and brought to the Lord and placed into God's family. Now he was an Egyptian, a type of a sinner. Secondly, notice his woeful condition. He said, I fell sick. Here's a man that had fallen sick. In verse 13, David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago, I fell sick. A sick brother. This man had been here for three days and three nights without any food and without any water. And he was starving. He was perishing without food or water. And he was a sick man. And he was left out there alone. That's a picture of every lost sinner today. He's out in the world, away from God. And he's dead spiritually and he's physically dying. God gives us a description of sinners in Romans chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6 and many other places in the Bible. Now in Luke chapter 15 and verse 17, you notice in that scripture, I'll call your attention to it, you don't have to turn there. We find a young man that wandered away from home, and he was down at the hog pen, feeding up on the food that the hogs did eat. And he said, I perish with hunger. I perish with hunger. I'm going back to my father's house where I can find food. He perished with hunger. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 15, Sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. Now here's a man sick, dying, just a matter of time he'd be dead physically. So is every sinner out in the world, he's dead spiritually. In just a matter of time he'd be dead physically. He's like the Egyptian out in the world, he's perishing with hunger. He doesn't have spiritual food. He doesn't know what it's all about, he's starving out there. That's why you have so many sinners today that's running hither and thither, drinking beer, wine, and liquor, smoking pot, and, and taking dope, and running wild because they're looking for something they don't have. Many of them been slaughtered on the highways. Many of them killed in fights. Many of them die with terrible diseases because they don't have what God can give. Now he said, I perish with hunger. That is a woeful condition. That's a picture of every sinner. Notice number three, his sad plight. He said in verse 13, My master left me because three days ago I fell sick. Now here's a man, no doubt was a good servant to his master. His master had captured him and had used him as long as he was available or could help him. But when the man became ill, his master said, I have no more need for you. I'll just leave you out in the field and let you die. Your liability is not an asset anymore, and you can just die in the field. That's exactly what the devil will do for you. The devil will destroy your body and let you suffer the rest of your days. There's people right now listening to the sound of my voice. You have wrecked your body drinking liquor, smoking cigarettes, living a wild life, and you're going to suffer the rest of your days because of it. Had you lived a good, clean life, you wouldn't be in the condition you're in now, chances are. And the devil is laughing about it. And he'll let you suffer the rest of your days. Let me say something to you young people. Would you like to remain strong and handsome and beautiful and lovely and have good health and a beautiful body? You abstain from all alcohol beverages, beer, wine, liquor, or whatnot. You abstain from any kind of tobacco. I don't care whether you smoke it or chew it or swallow it or suck it or what. You abstain from all kind of tobacco. Some people say, well, I don't smoke, I'll just dip it. That's not quite as bad. 
All right, go ahead. When you end up with a mouth cancer, you're going to find out you wasn't so wise. Beloved, don't start smoking. Don't start dipping and chewing. Keep your body clean by all means. And by all means, don't taste any dope of any kind. You'll destroy your body. There's a lot of young people today who are wrecks. Their bodies have been wrecked already and they're still young because of the things I've just mentioned. If you want to be wise, strong, live a long time, stay in good health, abstain from all of these things that multitudes have allowed to wreck them physically and spiritually. And this man was left for dead. He was a slave to his master. But when he became ill, then his master had no need for him. And the devil right now is laughing at a lot of people in the human race today because they let him allow him to cause them to wreck their bodies and their health is bad and they're going to suffer the rest of their days because they listen to the devil and follow after the flesh and they'll have to suffer for it. Now Judas is carrot, you know. He served his purpose. The high priest and the elders said, Judas, uh, what would you uh, charge us to go and betray Jesus in our hands? And Judas began to dicker with them about the price thereof, and they settled for 30 pieces of silver. And they gave Judas his carrot 30 pieces of silver, and he went out and betrayed Jesus Christ. And when he realized what he had done, he came back and said to the people, as I have betrayed the innocent blood, I, I want to come back and do something about it. And he threw the money out to him, and they said, Judas, that's your little red wagon. You pull that one. That's your little baby. You take care of that one. We got what we want. And poor old Judas, after he was used by that ungodly religious crowd, then they laughed at him. What did Judas do? Judas went out and hanged himself and went to his own place according to the Bible. There's people today that's in trouble. People today that's in prison. People in jail today because they listen to the devil and run with the wrong crowd. And now the devil is laughing about it. And many of them have spent most of their time in prison. Many of a young boy today in prison that's been most of his life behind bars. And the devil is really laughing about that. When the devil gets through with you, he'll cast you aside and tell you to do the best you can. You've been a fool and, and he'll laugh at you. Now let's come to thought number four and that is his deliverance. Look at verse 11. And they brought him to David. He was too weak and ill to come of himself. And so was every sinner. And David was a stranger. Every sinner is too weak and ill today to save himself. No man can save himself. He has to be brought to a stranger. And that stranger to them is Jesus Christ. He's not a stranger to you, but he's a stranger to sinners today. And he has to be brought to them, or brought to Christ rather. Too weak to help himself. No sinner can save himself. No sinner can be good enough to get to heaven. No sinner can buy his way in. You've got to be brought by the Spirit of God to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a stranger to sinners, and He will become your friend and you can become acquainted with Him. But no sinner can get there alone. In John chapter 6 and verse 44, it says, No man come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. So that sinner is helpless. He's dead spiritually. And if he's saved, God will have to draw him. The Spirit of God will have to draw him. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings him to Jesus Christ. And if God is speaking to your heart now, you need to heed that and come to the Lord before it's too late. They brought this man to David. He couldn't walk. He was too ill to do so, too weak to do so. And they brought him to David. And David here is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man is brought to him. He's the one to bring sinners to. Bring them to Christ. He's the only one that can save them. The preacher can't do it. The preacher can only point him to the dear Savior. Notice number five, his deliverer. His deliverer is none other than David. You'll find here in the Bible he's brought to David. No doubt he was a sad looking lot as he was carried in the presence of the man made after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart. He has a pitiful looking Egyptian, a sick man left in the field to die. No more good for his master. And they brought him to David. But it was this roaring condition that drew David's compassion toward him. That's the way it is with our Savior. When David saw this poor emaciated man 
lying there in the field, hadn't had his aid eaten three days and three nights, no water to drink, been left there by his master, very ill, soon to die. The big heart of David had compassion on this man. His heart went out to this man. And that's the way it is with Jesus. The heart of God is compassionate and goes out to sinners. Now God doesn't love your sin, but He loves the sinner. And God's heart goes out to that sinner. And God will pardon you from your sins and write your name in heaven if you let Him do so. So this man is brought to David. And David is a type of Jesus. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son... That whosoever believed him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's exactly what Jesus did. Let's notice thought number six, and that is his entertainment. In verse 11 and 12, you find his entertainment. And they gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. Now this is a picture of those that's brought to Christ. None is sent away empty. Here's a poor man in a poor, emaciated condition. Brought to King David. David looked upon him with a compassionate heart. And David saw to it that this man did not go away empty. This man received something. He was entertained by David himself. There he was given bread. There he was given water to drink. There he was given cakes of figs and raisins. This man needed this strength and this help that he would receive from this food. Now when the prodigal son came home, the father said, go kill the fatted calf. That boy had been out at the hog pen. He'd been away from home for a long time. He was about to starve to death. He'd been eating the food that the hogs ate. And he was hungry. He said, in my father's house is bread to spare. And we arrived back home. His father said, now I want you to go get a mess of onions and garlic. No, see, he didn't say that. The father said, I want you to go out to the barn. And I want you to select a fatted calf. That calf has been put up and fattened. And we're saving for a special occasion. I want you to bring that calf out and kill that calf. We're going to have a feast around here. This my son's on starvation. My son's in desperate need. And we want to give him some good old fatted calf. And they went out and they killed the calf and they brought it in. And my, what a feast they did have. He received the very best the father had there in his uh, barn. Beloved, that's what happens to sinners when they come to God. God gives them his very best. No greater thing could God give you than salvation. And salvation is in Jesus Christ. And he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And salvation is God's gift from heaven. And you need to realize that this man received blessings from King David, which is the type of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's move on to thought number seven, and that is... His confession. Look at verse 13, will you please? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And so he admitted that he was from Egypt. And he admitted that he was a servant of the enemies of Israel. He said, I am a young man of Egypt. I am a servant to an Amalekite. Now before converts can be saved, that is before people can be saved, a new convert must confess that he's a sinner, that he's of the world, that uh, he's been fallen uh, the master, the devil, his master, the devil, the god of this world system. He doesn't have to go into detail about that, but he must realize that. And when he comes to Jesus and realizes his lost condition, realizes he's been following the wrong one, he's willing now to change and do an about face. He repents in his heart. The Spirit of God is dealing with his soul. And when he repents from his heart, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ with repentance, then he's quickened by the Spirit of God and made alive and baptized into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. But he's got to confess he's a sinner. Now before you can get people saved today, 
you've got to get them lost. You have a lot of people, they, they belong to big shot churches, and they hear a little social gospel. They don't know what salvation's all about. They have their ears tickled, their back scratched, and they know nothing about true salvation. Now, you'll never get those people saved, you get them lost. They think they're all right. They've been going to Sunday school. They came up in the Sunday, in the Sunday school department. They've been going to some big shot church, been entertained for a long time. And they think they're fine. They live a fairly moral, clean life. And they good neighbors. They live in the up the up section of town. And they, they think they're just wonderful. Now you've got to get them people lost before you can get them saved. They're on the road to hell and don't realize it. They're on the downward road to hell fire. And also unless they realize that they're lost and repent and receive Jesus Christ, they'll end up in hell like every drunk and cusser in this country. Because they die without God. See, the preacher has a job to do. you got to get the up and out lost before you can get them saved because they don't know they're lost. They think they're all right. That's a treetop society crowd. That's the elite crowd. They, they, they think just because they're in the treetop society group that they go into heaven, go to march in, but they're going straight to hell as any drunk and cusser in this country if they haven't been saved. I don't care how clean they are, how popular they are, how wealthy they may be. That's exactly where they're going. And the preacher's business is get them lost. And if he can get them to see they're lost, he might be able to get them saved, but not until he gets them lost first. All right, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Number eight, notice his obligation. Verse 15. And David said, Can thou bring me down to this company? Now after David had rescued this man, had picked him up, had fed him, got him on his feet, now David requires of him an obligation. After God saves you, God requires of you an obligation. God expects you to do something. In verse 15, David said, Kenneth, I'll bring me down this company. David pressed his claims upon the one whom he had befriended. It was more in a form of appeal than a direct command. David said, Kenneth, thou bring me down to these people that you were with. God says, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, verse 1. God is saying, won't you come? I beseech you to come. I beg you to come. Now let me have your bodies. I want to use you. You have let the devil use you all these years. I want to use you. Now your body belongs to God. God is not commanding here. He's beseeching. David is not demanding He's uh, beseeching this man. He said, uh, uh, could you show me where those people are that you were with? And the man, of course, said, yes, I'd be delighted to do so. Now, that was his obligation. He was willing to go and show David where those people were that were often left him in the field. Now we come to thought number nine, and that is his desire for some assurance. Now, before he led David down to this company, these Amalekites, he wanted some assurance from them, from David, that David would not let these men harm him. Notice the scripture, verse 15. And he said, Swear unto me by God, that thou wouldst neither kill me, nor deliver me into the hands of your, my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. That's verse 15. Now this man recognizes here Jehovah God, David's God. He said, You swear by God. Jehovah God, that if I lead you down to these people, after I show you where they are, that you won't kill me, neither would you let my former master kill me. And David said, I'll take care of you. I'll keep you. You don't have to worry. Your former master will never get you. I'll promise you that. That's exactly what Jesus Christ promises every child of God. Jesus promised if you'll get saved, that he'll keep you, save you from the guttermost to the othermost. That he'll keep you and carry you to heaven. And that the devil will never get a chance to get your soul. Now he, God's not going to let him do it. God promises to keep his very own. And your old master, the devil that you serve, can never get your soul. He'll give you a hard time, but he can't get that soul. God promised to land your soul in heaven. And the devil has no chance to get it. That's a promise from God to every person that accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, if God would turn all of his children over to the devil, their souls, he'd be so mad and angry until he'd, uh, he'd torment them every way he could. 
because they have done, they've been working against him. But God will never do that. God will never do that. Now there can be no real joy in serving the new master until assurance that you'll not be turned over the old one. Now this man could not be happy until he found out for sure that David would not turn him over to these Amalekites. Now when he found that out, then he can shout the victory. Now when you find out that God will never turn your soul over to the devil, you can shout all the way to heaven. You can jump over, over hell on a sewing thread and, and, uh, and shout the victory because God will never let it break. God will see to it that you land in heaven. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says, Wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. You've been delivered from the wrath to come. You don't have to worry about the wrath to come. You've been delivered from it. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. God's not going to allow you to be tempted above you're able to bear. Sin's not going to overpower you. Sin will not have dominion over you. God will see you through if you'll come to God and serve Him, be faithful, and expect Him to do so. So his desire for assurance is granted, and now he's willing to show David where the enemies are. And when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, then remember you're in a different camp. You've been taken out of the devil's camp and placed in God's camp, and God will never let the devil take you out of his camp and put you back in his. Now that assurance you have, and you ought to praise God about that all the way through. Then finally, number 10, his gratitude. Look at verse 16. And when he had brought him down, notice his gratitude, he brought him down to the people. He was grateful for what David had done for him, and so he brought him down to the people. He was now devoted to the interests of David and did as David requested and brought him down to the camp. And David and his 400 men uh, took the camp over, recaptured their wives, got all their possessions, and there uh, slew those men except about 400 that got on camels and took off. Can you imagine how fast they were going on top of those camels as they took off? David killed the rest of them, captured the rest of them, took everything they had, took all the belongings that they had taken from a Ziklag, and there they got all together. And this young man now was serving a new master. Now he would have food to eat. He'd have clothes to wear. He could be healed. And he could serve David, a man after God's own heart, the rest of his days. That's exactly what God does when you come to know him. And he was now devoted to the interests of David. And the, as he they did as they requested, of course. Ephesians 2.10 for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So when God rescues you from the camp of the devil, you're God's property, created unto good works. You're serving a new master, and you serve Him faithfully as long as you live upon the earth. Thank you kindly. You listen well. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. Save somebody out in the radio listening audience. Speak to hearts today. Bless this people here in this building. May your name be honored, our Father. Thank you, God, we've been delivered out of the camp of the Amalekites and been placed in the camp of David. Thank you, our Father. Have you in this invitation, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, while Debbie is playing on the organ for just a moment or so, listen to me. If you're in this building and you're unsaved and you ought to be saved if you'll come down here and trust Christ, God will save you. We'll help you. Secondly, if you're in this building and you once knew God and walked with God and fellowship with God and you've lost out with the Lord and you're not happy, if you'll come down here, we'll help you get restored back into fellowship. Number three, if you're in this building and you want to join this church in the way we receive members here at Northside, you may present yourself. Number four, if there's any other reason that you feel obligated to come, would you come while they be placed? Would you come? God is speaking to your heart. Would you come?
哭